let's get the show on the road. So this week, remember what I said last week, we're going to be talking about worry, because that's where we're up to as we go through Matthew. Um, Jesus talking about worry and anxiety, two uh, things that happen to all of us, probably on a weekly basis. We hardly week go by where we don't worry, we're going to anxious about something, even though the Bible tells us not to. Now, just before I do that, last week we had the offering for chapter C. Um, I know um, Mark's got that money. If you weren't here last week and you want to give to chapter C, because we're going to do a check at the end of this week to send off to the South Coast chapter C. So if anybody couldn't give last week, please see myself or Mark during the week. He's not here tonight. Um, so um, just so you know, that's just for chapter C, and then we'll, we'll send the check off, and I'll let you know what that amount is next week, and that's going towards the South Coast uh, chapter C support group. And that was a good week last week with Stephen, so thank you for coming. And as you know, on Tuesday night, some of our Bible study people um, that aren't here now have got COVID. We assume that was after Bible study because they tested on Friday morning. So that's why a table over here aren't here. So it was, um, we've got Alfred and Nicole, we've got Monica and Andy, and then also we know Little Barnes during the week and also Alison from the Op Shop. So there's quite a few from, from the village that have caught COVID, so yeah, let's see, pray before, keep praying for those uh, people in the church that have got COVID, and that's one of the reasons we're going to have a Bible study this Tuesday, because Sharon and I have got um, her dad's son um, funeral this Tuesday, so we won't be here, and you know, you know, so we've got something on, and then the two people I asked to lead it, they both got COVID, so we just figured we'll just have Bible study the week after, so that's how it's going to work, so um, I think that's all I have to say on that, so as I said, we're going to be talking about worry tonight, and um, Worry takes on different forms, doesn't it? And Jesus said to us not to worry. Paul tells us not to worry. And yet we do. We still worry, don't we? And sometimes it's just over little things, sometimes over huge things, but we still worry. And I want to try and just go through some, just some basic principles that Jesus talked about, that Paul talked about, and even some stories just to get us, give us an understanding. Because... You know, I'd love to say, don't worry again, and Jesus wants us not to worry, but we will. It's just our human nature, but it's how we overcome that worry and how we work with that worry that I want to talk about tonight. So, in the passage that we're going to read tonight, I want to read the preceding passage as well, because if you look at the Matthew 6 when Jesus talks about worry, just before that, he's actually talking about money and possessions. And if you read on, in my, my verse, it actually says, that is why, so I've just talked about money and possessions, and, all, and the other version says, therefore. So we need to read, go back and understand what Jesus is talking about, money and possessions, because a lot of the anxiety in life has got to do with money and possessions. So I'm going to read it. Now, it's not on the screen, because I'm actually, um, this week I was just having to pick up my Charles Swindoll study Bible, and I'm, I'm just thinking, this is a really good version. It's actually the New Living Translation. So I'm using the New Living Translation tonight. It's not up on the screen, so I'll get you to follow me tonight. I'm going to read Matthew 6, and it's 19 to 34. So this is Jesus teaching, continuing as we continue on with the Beatitudes and Seven on the Mount. So Jesus said, Don't store up treasures here on earth, where moths eat them and rust destroys them, and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven, where moths and rust cannot destroy, and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Your eye is like a lamb that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. And then he goes on, he says, And that is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And that you far more valuable to him than they are. Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. 
They don't work or make their clothing. Yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. So seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we've read this passage, and Lord, been challenged about the things we worry about. And Lord, as we focus on this worry and anxiety, it takes up so much time in people's lives. Lord, we just want to look at the way we respond to that through looking at your word and through your spirit, Lord, <coughs> who speak to each one of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so worry and anxiety. You can go right back to the Old Testament. In fact, you can go right back to the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve first sinned, what happened? They were scared. When they realised that they'd sinned, they knew God was going to come into the garden. And the Bible tells us that they were scared and they were worried and they were fearful of what God was going to do to them. They knew they had sinned. In fact, the Bible tells us they were naked and they never... And they never knew that before, but all of a sudden they felt shame. And all these things came, all these things came into their life because of the sin that happened in their life. But one thing was that it brought fear and it brought anxiety into their life. And it was there for the rest of their life, unfortunately, because of their sin. And we only have to read a little bit further on. Another story that's found in Genesis 32. It's the story of Jacob and Esau. Now, a lot of us know the story of Jacob. Um, he was one of the patriarchs, and he was, a, um, a, you know, he, he was the founder of, the, of Israel. And so, a great man, yet, in his early life, he chose to be deceitful, he chose to lie, he chose to scheme. And with his mother, he realised that because he wasn't the firstborn, he wasn't going to receive the blessing of his father. And so, with his mother, he schemed so that he would receive the birthright. Through the lying and deceitfulness. He cheated on the birthright, he took the birthright from his brother Esau, and then when Esau found out, he threatened to kill him. And so for the rest, for many, many years, Jacob was on the run because of Esau, his brother, because Esau, and who, who, who blames Esau? He lost his birthright, and so Esau was after him to get him for revenge. And yet years had passed, God blessed Esau with a huge uh, flock because basically wealth was, was um, basically valued through your property, uh, through your family, and through the sheep and goats that you had. And Esau had a huge, um, and they say camels, sheep, goats, and a huge harem of wives and family. And Jacob was the same. They, God blessed both of them. And we read in the story, if you go to, uh, in Genesis 32, that Jacob, he, he um, encountered God one night and he said, it said that he fought with God. And yet, a few hours later, his, his um, servants tell him that Esau, his brother, is looking for him. And instead of thinking, after all this night in prayer, being with God all night, instead of saying, right, I've got God on my side, he panics. The Bible says that he was terrified, absolutely terrified. And he sent servants out in front you know, with all these gifts for Esau, and he was absolutely terrified of what was going to take place. And yet all Esau wanted to do was reconcile with his brother. And we read in Genesis 32 and 33 that Jacob reconciled with Esau. Esau didn't want to hurt him. Esau didn't want any, he didn't want all the gifts, but, but Jacob made him take the gifts out of guilt, I think. But it's an interesting story. So you've got Adam and Eve, who were anxious and worried because of their sin, You've got Jacob, who's spent a whole night with God, and yet still had this anxiety and this worry over his brother. And so, if it happened in the Old Testament, it goes right into the New Testament, and it continues on today. But I also want to tell you that there's some great stories in the Bible about people that chose not to disobey God. 
because in these situations where worry and anxiety take place, it's because people have taken their eyes off of God, they've taken their eyes off the Lord. And I can think of people like Joseph, who never took his eyes off the Lord, or hardly ever. He just had that faithfulness, and he never, he hardly ever worried. He should have been the one that worried his little head off for the things that happened to him. He chose not to worry. I think of Nehemiah that rebuilt the wall in Jerusalem. He chose not to worry. He chose to trust God through all the difficulty and all the difficult times he had to go through. And I think even of, of Solomon, the great Solomon, who trusted in God right through his life. We also see in the Old Testament Proverbs. I love this proverb. It's in Proverbs 12:25. It says, "Worry weighs a person down." And when you think about worry, I like that because it reminds me of the story of Pilgrim's Progress when he carried that burden on his back because he was worried about where he was going. It wasn't until he encountered based in the story where, he, where he, he meets Jesus and he, and he becomes a Christian, but he understands what it means to be saved. And the burden falls off his back. And that's a bit like worry. It says here, worry weighs a person down. And when we can remove that worry, the burden is lifted. Simple as that, isn't it? Well, is it simple? It's not sometimes, is it? But Prophet tells us that. It goes on, it says, an encouraging word cheers a person up. <coughs> so worry weighs a person down, an encouraging word cheers a person up. So, we are, in this modern world, prone to stress and worry. I'm sure all of us can relate to sleepless nights, to loss of appetite, to lack of concentration, because we're worrying over a particular thing. And in case of what Jesus was talking about, it may be over money. It could be the so many different things that can happen. It could be little things. It could be big things. It could be worried. But the Apostle Paul tells us not to be anxious. And I'm going to, I mean, I, I know Philippians 4, 6 and 7 off by heart because I memorized it when I was at Bible College. It's under the New American Standard Version. But I like the New Living Testament. And I'm going to read it to you. So Philippians 4, 6 and 7. This is talking about worrying and anxiety. So it says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. I like that. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live. In Christ Jesus. I like that. Not to worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Instead of worrying, we start praying. And Jesus said in Matthew 6.33, the same translation, he said, Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. And like I said a few weeks ago, it's not everything you want, it's everything you need. And that's what Jesus was talking about when he was talking about the clothing, the food and the shelter. He talked about the lilies. He talked about the wildflowers. He talked about nature itself, how he's created it to just be able to survive under God's canopy. They survive. He's got everything for those birds, for the wildflowers. And it, isn't it great when you can just get going in the middle of nowhere and just see the wildflowers or just see the birds feeding and just know that God is looking after them. And as Jesus said, if my father can look after them so well, and he does, he will look after you. So don't worry. And that's what he's saying, don't worry. So to help understand the worry we all go through, I want to tell you a story about a family of three siblings. Their name were Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. They lived in a little town in Bethany, just out of Jerusalem. Now, Jesus had some special friends in his ministry. And just like us, he needed time out. He needed to be able to go to a house. Have you got somewhere where you can go where you can go to a friend's house and you can just throw your shoes off, have a drink, and just talk about anything? Well, that's what this Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were like to Jesus. He could just go there, relax, and just be himself. But at the same time, he was still able to share with them and, and I guess, um, have meals with them and just be himself. And so, this story that's found in Luke is a story of Jesus rocking up to the house, and they're all there, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And anyway, it's, 
it's probably lunchtime. And so Lazarus was obviously chatting to Jesus. And there's Mary, the younger sister, just probably um, Jesus. And she's just looking up at Jesus and she's listening and she's taking in everything he says. Because she knows he's the Messiah. And she's just soaking everything he's saying and just, just totally in the moment, listening and learning from Jesus. And then we've got the older sister, Martha. Now Martha, we all need Marthas, because if we didn't have Marthas, we wouldn't get a meal. So Martha is organising the meal. She's making sure that the laundry is clean. She's making sure that everything's ready. Now she's got the oven on, she's got the, uh, the pies in the oven, she's, got the, she's just done the chocolate brownies, and she's got everything ready. And she's thinking, oh, the, the, the serviettes aren't out. Where's Mary? And she's starting to panic and she starts to worry and she starts getting angry. She just comes into the room where Jesus is sitting there and she's, look, Jesus, can you do something about my sister? I'm doing everything myself and I'm not coping and you need to tell her off. You need to tell her off. And what does Jesus do? Well, let's read the story because I think it's a great little story. It's only four verses and it's found in Luke chapter 10. So I'm going to read it right now. All in the New Living Translation tonight, I just haven't had that problem with me this week. So it's Luke chapter 10. Four verses that tell a lot. But it says, As Jesus and, his, and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he taught. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Can you feel that? I'm not happy. <laughs> Tell her to come and help me. Now, what would you have done if a, if a man, Martha come up to you? Well, I'd probably have said, Mary, you're going to get out but what does Jesus say? But the Lord said to her, My dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. There is only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. Isn't that amazing? Because I think most of us would have tried to alleviate the situation by getting Mary out there helping, probably even get Lazarus out there as well, just to keep Martha happy because she seems to be running the show. You know, every church and every organisation has the Marthas and we need Marthas. In fact, what we do need is Mary-like Marthas. That's what we need, Mary-like Marthas. Because if we, um, if you follow this story so through to fruition, if we didn't have Marthas, we'd never get fed, would we? Because we'd always sit at the feet of Jesus, wouldn't we? <laughs> and we'd never get fed. We do need Marthas. But in this situation, Jesus was obviously sharing something intimate. And he didn't need he didn't need feeding at that time. He just wanted to share, and Martha could not see that. And he gives the honour to Mary for sitting at the feet of Jesus. And he didn't. I don't think he told Martha. He just reminded her. You know, there are times when you don't need to worry about the big news. There's times you don't need to worry about all the fuss and bother. You just need to focus on me because that's what he wanted to. He was heading towards the cross, and he was obviously sharing some deep and intimate things with his friends. And he just wanted Martha to sit at his feet as well and just listen and enjoy the occasion and not worry about the food at that particular time. It's an interesting story. So, Martha, she couldn't stop her household duties just to take that time out to listen to Jesus. So she was distracted, she was worried, she was anxious. And then she blew her top. So let's look at Martha's character. Well, there's a fixation there, isn't there? There's a frustration there, and there's an anxiety. One writer said, and I like this, he said, when we become consumed by worry and buried by busyness, we can quickly, we can quickly strangle our ability to distinguish the incidentals from the essentials. That's pretty deep, really. I'll say it again. When we become consumed by worry and buried by busyness, we can quickly strangle our ability to distinguish the incidentals from the essentials. So we build up so many worries in our minds 
that we can't relax. And what does that do? It steals the joy away. It snuffs out joy. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Now when you're worried and you snuff out, we'll take out joy. It's very hard to be joyful when I don't see many joyful worry, worry wars. I don't see many people at peace that worry. And I don't see people showing love. So really, it snuffs out the fruit of the Spirit. So by cancelling out worry and listening to Jesus, giving our anxieties over to Jesus, as he said, cast all our cares on him because he cares for us. So we cast our cares on him. And what happens? The fruit of the Spirit comes back. Because the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and peace. And that's what... It, it, um, stands us against other people. When we're standing in this world, what shows up? The salt and the light, but also the love, the joy, and the peace. But if I'm going around anxious and worrying, you will not see love, you will not see joy, and you will not see peace. So worry snuffs out joy. When you think about it, Jesus responds to our anxiety exactly the same way as he did to Martha. In verse 41 he said, My dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. There's only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it and it will not be taken away from her. So what did Mary have? I believe she had a passionate desire to settle the teaching of Jesus and to be with him. For Martha, the busyness of life and wanting to have everything just right caused her to take her eyes off Jesus. So I ask myself the question, is there anything in my life that's causing me to take my eyes off Jesus? Is there anything in my life that's causing me to take my eyes off Jesus? I want to close, it's only a short one tonight, I want to close with three words. Last week Stephen gave us three words. Jesus is Lord. And I loved it. Jesus is Lord. Well, I've got three words I want to close with tonight. They all start with F so we can remember. As we think about worry, as we think about anxiety and getting rid of it out of our life so that we can have the fruit of the Spirit. Faith, Father, and first. So we've got faith, Father, and first. I'm going to go through it now. So faith, Matthew 6.30. I'll just go back to Matthew 6.30. So Matthew 6.30 says, And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and throw into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So faith. So trusting God to meet all our needs. So this week, as we think about faith, we're going to allow God, we're going to ask or have that trust to believe that God is going to meet all our needs. Not our wants, but he's going to meet all our needs. Faith. Father, Matthew 6, 32. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Your heavenly Father knows all your heavenly needs. So, Father, the sure knowledge that God cares for his children. He cares for each one of us. Faith, Father, and first, Matthew 6, 33. Uh, one verse says, Seek first the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. Above, uh, above all else, seek the kingdom of God. If we put God first, he will meet all our needs. So we've got faith, we've got Father, we've got first. Remember that? Matthew 6.30, Matthew 6.32. Matthew 6, 33. So this week, we're going to trust God to meet all our needs. We're going to seek first his kingdom. And finally, we're going to put God first because we know he will meet all our needs because he's told us in his word. So I'm going to pray now. I'm going to ask the band to come up. We're going to finish with a new song. You may not know it. If you know it, sing along. If not, then just enjoy the song. So I'll just get them to come up and sing the song now. And um, I'll, I'm gonna, at the end of it, I'll pray. And, um, yeah, and then I'll stand up to, the, to surrender now.